We live in a world of ever-increasing dangers. We want, we need, to find a way of reducing the risks we all face. One of the ways of doing that is through the use of statecraft and leadership. I'm going to be talking to a range of experts about the past and the future of statecraft and leadership. Can it prevent us from destroying ourselves in the modern era? Benedetta Berti is Head of Policy Planning at the Office of the Secretary General at NATO. NATO is undergoing a profound strategic, military and political adaptation. I talked to Benedetta Berti about the transatlantic alliance in an era of strategic competition. It's not that long ago, is it? We were having a debate about whether NATO should exist anymore. We've come a long way in a, in a pretty short time. Yeah, we definitely have. Uh... I think uh, you're alluding to a few a few years ago some remarks about NATO being brain dead and having lost its way and I would say even back then my response was I, I don't think that I don't think we're, that we are quite diagnosing uh, the state of the organization the same way because back then 2018 2019 I thought well NATO is undergoing actually uh, a really profound transformation uh, from a military and political perspective, meaning that after 2014, when Russia illegally and illegitimately annexed Crimea, that really was a wake-up call for NATO as an organization. And starting from the military planning perspective, there was really a call to, well, and going back to some of the fundamentals of NATO in terms of rebuilding our ability to do collective defense, pivoting back to understand what does it take to ensure the territorial defense of Europe, really quite questions that for decades we had uh, we had put aside simply because our assumption was that security environment was more benign and that threats and challenges will come mostly from out of area, not from within the Euro-Atlantic area at large. So in a sense, I think that even back then, talking about NATO having lost its purpose, missed the fact that NATO was undergoing a profound military transformation to enable what we're doing now, which is really strengthening our deterrence and defense, but also politically, I think NATO continue to be very much the organizing principle, not just for the defense of Europe, but also for the transatlantic community at a strategic and political level. And I think that continue to be a key function of the alliance for 74 plus year. Uh, so in that sense, I think that NATO's purpose, even though today, I don't think anybody can doubt the importance of the organization. I think that really, even back then, uh, NATO was essential to the way we think about security. You talk after 2014 of the, the military side of planning, planning for Europe's yeah. defense. What was the politics there? Because I'm thinking a lot of the things that happened in 2014, but other aggressive moves from Russia, were not always met with a political pushback uh, in, in Europe. Uh, did, did that have an impact on NATO, on NATO's speed in preparing itself? Well, I think that is a very, a very fair point. And uh, the, the, the question is, what if uh, after 2014, as an international community, as a transatlantic community, we would have had a more uh, assertive response when it comes to calling out, uh, calling out Russia for its violation of international law and for its aggressive behavior. And I think that's a fair question. I would even say, what if that conversation had occurred in 2008 after the war in Georgia, or even in 2007 when President Putin actually well went to the Munich Security Conference and delivered a speech in which he fundamentally said the post Cold War order that we have set up it's simply something that, that i don't believe serves my interests i don't it doesn't serve my vision of russia as a revisionist new imperialist power so in a way the messages were there um and i think that is a very important discussion that we're having and the important point for me is are we learning those lessons are we learning the lessons that when our assertive authoritarian competitors are telling us what they wish to do that we actually take them seriously um, are we learning the lesson that when it comes to assertive authoritarian powers we need to be uh, strong in our deterrence strong in our defense resolute in our messaging 
um, understanding that any perception of disunity or weakness will be exploited against us. I think we are learning those lessons and I think it's very important. Uh, are we learning the lessons about strategic dependencies, right? Uh, after, after 2022 and the beginning of this fully fledged war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, many European countries uh, understood the penny dropped about the risks of one-sided dependency on Russian oil and gas. And we have done a lot quite quickly to wean ourselves off that, uh, that Russian oil and gas and to decouple ourselves. Uh, but the question is, are we learning that lesson when it comes to other potential strategic dependencies? So I'm turning a bit your question on its head and saying, yeah, maybe mistakes were made, but the important point is that we learn and that we move forward. Yeah. Uh, and you, you mentioned a very important one, obviously, the strategic dependence on, on oil and gas. What, where, what other areas would you say there is still work to be done? Well, I think broadly speaking, if there is one defining trend of our security environment, it's the rise of strategic competition. And we all talk about it, but very practically what that means, I think that uh, our potential adversary and competitors are deliberately using all the tools in their toolbox. And that means economic, ideological, political, technological, military. And we need to be uh, better at understanding the, this all across the spectrum mixing of military and non-military tools. So that means economic policies. We need to be better at integrating national security considerations. Um, strategic vulnerabilities in our economy, in our assets, in our critical infrastructure, those can become security liabilities. So we need to be uh, actively investing in our resilience and in protecting those strategic assets. Uh, I think there's important work ongoing in the right direction on all of these issues. But frankly, we are catching up because for many years, especially uh, as Europeans, I think we had uh, we had operated under the assumption of benign security environment where more co economic cooperation will bring us closer politically and where interdependencies will create uh, positive externalities. And we have sort of underestimated that there is a darker side to these interdependencies. And when we, we depend too much, you know, one-sided ways on, on, on potential opponents or competitors who don't share our values and have a fundamentally different vision of how to organize the international order, well, those dependencies can become vulnerabilities. So I think that understanding is there now, but of course that needs to translate, be translated into action. Yeah, and when you say that understanding is there, it's, it's there among peoples as well, isn't it? Which is, of course, an important part of, of this whole jigsaw that, that actually uh, it, it's more widely understood, isn't it, among members of the public who elect governments, at least in the West, that those things are happening and that those things have got to be thought about. I believe so. And I believe really uh, over the last plus year since Russia started its war of aggression against Ukraine, I think that was a catalyst uh, for many of our citizens in terms of understanding, well, defense matters more than it has for years and we need to take that seriously. Uh, war has returned to Europe. Uh, there are uh, actors out there with, who have completely different understanding of how to organize the international system and the European security uh, order and that we need to take that seriously. So I think if I follow the public debate in many allied societies, there has really been a sea change in talking about security, talking about defense, talking about values and how support, uh, supporting Ukraine is actually incredibly important for us to, for those of us who believe in a free, open, uh, rules-based international order and that still have a vision of a Europe whole and free. So I think those conversations are back uh, in the public debate, and that's certainly an important and very positive trend the way I see it. Does that lead to a more equitable funding of NATO? In other words, the United States possibly being less relied upon and Europeans, all European countries, stepping up? I think that's happening. I think there's more work to be done. I think that's no secret. Uh, but again, if you go back to 2014, uh, when after Russia's uh, legal annexation of Crimea, that's when within NATO we, there were very, very intense discussions about the issue of what is an equitable and fair burden sharing. 
and connected to that, what is a, what is a reasonable uh, target in terms of defense spending so that we're spending uh, in a way that commensurate to the threats and challenges we face. Because after the end of the Cold War, many of our countries really de-emphasize defense spending because fundamentally they thought we don't need to do that so we can divert those resources towards priority, which is reasonable when the threat is lower, you spend less in defense. But post-2014, the assessment is that doesn't work anymore. We need to spend more on defense. First, uh, because the security environment demands it. And I think that's very important. European allies of NATO are not just spending more because it's the right thing to do in terms of burden sharing. They're spending more because it's the right thing to do in terms of facing the threats that are out there. So it is in their national interest. Uh, but the, the, the reality is since 2014, you have seen that pledge to move towards spending 2% of defense. You've seen um, countries, more countries meeting that benchmark. You see roughly 350 billion extra added to defense between 2014 and now, which uh, by, non, uh, by, by Canada and European allies of NATO, so non-US contributions. So you, the, the trend is positive, but I think again, going back to the fact that we are in the most difficult and dangerous security environment, I think for generations, uh, we just cannot rest on our laurels and say that's enough. And that's why uh, in, in, a few me in a few weeks, uh, heads of state of government of NATO countries will meet in Vilnius in Lithuania. And part of the discussion is how do we cement that 2% as the absolute minimum, as the floor, not the ceiling of our defense spending? And how do we put at the center of our discussion anchoring that commitment for the long term? and also sending that, using that also to send the right demand signal to our defense industry, which needs to have the certainty that we will continue to commit uh, in our defense, in our deterrence and defense at home and in supporting Ukraine so that they can ramp up the industrial production, which is also another very urgent need, I think. What does Vilnius say about Ukraine? What does it need to say about Ukraine, do you think? I think when it comes to the Vilnius summit and when it comes to support for Ukraine, there's going to be two main elements. Uh, one is the practical support. And I think I cannot emphasize how important that is, because, of course, uh, we know that uh, for Ukraine to continue to exercise its right to self-defense, for Ukraine to continue to push back against aggression, they need support, military, financial, humanitarian, and, of course, part uh, part of the part of the point of our heads of state and government meeting in Vilnius is to reiterate we're in it for the long term. We will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it is necessary, for as long as it takes, so that it can prevail as a sovereign independent country. From a NATO perspective, that translates into uh, stepping up the amount, not just the amount, but the, the range of support, non-lethal support that the allies provide through NATO over 500 million so far and going up uh, and anchoring that in a multi-year framework. So what does it mean? It means, yes, we continue to support Ukraine today with fuel, medical supplies, protective equipment, uh, so that it can continue to defend itself today. But we're also looking more and more at the longer term, how does NATO support the transition of the Ukrainian armed forces from Soviet legacy equipment to NATO interoperable? And in doing so, how do we support them coming closer to us as, as, as NATO, as an alliance? So there is going to be a big discussion over stepping up that practical support. And side by side, there's going to be uh, political commitment. First of all, to reiterate what the alliance has already decided many years ago, which is the future of Ukraine is in NATO, it's in the Euro-Atlantic family. Uh, also talking about how, how, also about sending a practical signal of political commitment by upgrading our political relations. And so we're working now through through essentially upgrading the framework we have to work with Ukraine uh, through a NATO Ukraine Council that would basically allow us to sit down as equals and co-shape decisions on certain matters that affect their security. So it's so it's practical support, it's stepping up the political commitment. And it's also talking about what's 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 the future, and the future of Ukraine is in NATO, 
And the future of Ukraine is a future in which after it prevails as a sovereign independent country, it's also supported so that it can continue to deter and defend credibly and so that Russia does not get to chip away at the European security order anymore. Right. So it's an, it's an end point where Ukraine is in NATO, but not attached to a date. I would, I would, I mean, of course, between now and then there's weeks of internal political discussions. But I think if I had to stress what are the two main priority, it is support for Ukraine now, because of course, uh, Ukraine can be NATO as a so after it prevails as a sovereign independent country. So in short, that, that happens now and uh, provide also a strong signal of political commitment. So I think those are, the, those are, to me, what the main deliverables in Vilnius. Talking of political commitment, when it comes to political commitment to NATO, um, Donald Trump, uh, his presidency is over, at least for the time being. He questioned NATO quite firmly at, at times. Um, how sure can NATO be that the United States remains as committed as it historically has been? It's a question that we get, and every time I, I go back to to a few uh, to a few, and I think really important points. Uh, one is, if you look at public opinion polling, if you look at support for NATO within U.S. Uh, public opinion, we are incredibly uh, so on solid grounds. That has been the case. Historically, it's particularly the case now in this in very complex security environment. Uh, support for NATO is very strong. Support for NATO is entirely bipartisan. Uh, you know that there are many issues in, in, in domestic US politics that are polarized or, part, or seen through the lens of partisanship that's not NATO. Uh, when you go on the hill and when you look at the political uh, scene, I would say it's very much it's very much the same, and um, I would I would uh, I would mention that during the prior just a few years ago, the the current the current NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg was invited as a bipartisan invitation by Congress to address the U.S. Congress, and that's something that's quite unique for an international for a leader of an international organization, and that was done on a bipartisan basis. So I would say. Uh, the, the support for NATO at the political and public opinion level in the United States is strong. Mm. Uh, through the Trump administration, it's no secret that there were discussions. Some points were, for example, about burden sharing and how can European allies spend more and spend better. And I think that's, that's a conversation that we've continued to have even after the Trump administration, we continue to have that conversation because it's the right thing to do to make sure that we put our alliance on an equitable footing when it comes to burden sharing. Uh, other discussions that were started during those years on how can we prepare the alliance for strategic competitions are also continuing. So, uh, so I would say that when I look at the global uh, at the global picture, and I also look at how important I think the NATO alliance remains for the United States, and we see that in, in all the national security strategies as one of the key assets of the United States. It's this alliance, allies, and partners. So I think I'm quite confident that uh, NATO as an organization and the transatlantic bond can endure shifting political winds as long as we do our homework and continue to day in and day out prove that we are of value and meet the national security interests of each and every ally, which I think we do. Let me bring it back to Ukraine. Uh, what has NATO learnt from the war and from the behaviour of Russia and from the tactics of Russia? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I would, I would say that we're still in the fog of war. So there's many lessons that we're identifying, but I think we also need to be humble and recognize that, unfortunately, we're still very much in the middle of, of this uh, brutal war of aggression. But there's, I think, some things that we have identified uh, at, the, at the grand strategic level that I think are going to continue to be relevant and useful for, for the years ahead, beyond just the conduct of Russia on the battlefield. Uh, one, I would say, is yet again going back to the to the point i was making before the essential role that the transatlantic uh, bond plays uh, in ensuring our security and defense and in ensuring our ability as the political west as the as the as the transatlantic community 
to act together. Um, for example, I think that the ability that we had after Russia started its war of aggression to to mobilize um, uh, sanctions, to push back on the international stage, all of that was enabled by the fact that we have an organization like NATO, where we were able to do those pre-consultations, where we were able to really build a transatlantic convergence uh, for the weeks preceding the invasion. So I think one is that we need to continue to really um, strengthen this institution because it is essential for our ability to act together when, when, when needed. Um, that's very, very, very political, but I think that that's, that's clear from, from the way of we have been able through NATO and also with the, with the European Union to act together to respond to Russia's war of aggression. Another lesson, I think, um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, and I mentioned this already, it's the dangers of relying on one-sided dependencies and vulnerabilities on author based on authoritarian competitors and adversaries. And we talked about dependency of Russian oil and gas. I think that's a central lesson that I hope we learn, and I hope we translate that into thinking, for example, on some of our strategic dependency on the People's Republic of China. But if I go more from the political to the more operational, I would say another really key lesson is the importance of this whole of society resilience and mobilization. And that's something that I think we can really learn from the way Ukraine has been fighting this war of aggression. And by it, I mean the, the way in which the armed forces, the civil society, everyone is mobilized and everyone is pushing back against aggression in a way that I think in many of our societies, well, we haven't quite thought about our defense and security in those terms for many years. And perhaps it's time that we have those conversations. So that importance of societal resilience, citizens' resilience, I think it's a lesson that uh, I certainly take from observing the Ukrainian bravery and the day in, day out bravery of ordinary people, which, essential, we are, so, which are so essential to their ability to do what we didn't expect them to be able yeah. to do. That's such an interesting point. And, and exactly as you say, we didn't expect it. We didn't see it coming. No. But, but the, the way in which everyone has become mobilized, as it were, is fascinating. Are, are you saying we have to genuinely think about how in other Western nations we would do that if the circumstances demanded it? I believe so. I believe so. And it, it doesn't have to, to, to be a discussion. We, we don't have to mirror the, the conversation happening in Ukraine. Of course, that's very specific to the tragic circumstances they're facing. But I think in each and every of our countries, there is a role to discuss what does it take to defend our security? What does it take to defend our democracy? What does it take to protect our freedom? And what role does each and every one of us play? And it does, of course, not everyone is mobilized at the military level, but there's so much else that enables the Ukrainian ability to resist. The civil society volunteering, the humanitarian support, the civil solidarity. I think all of that is really important. And perhaps we have over the years um, taken some of that for granted. And I think if there is a time, if there is a time to wake up and smell the coffee, it is really now. Of course, what some thinkers say is that the other thing we've learned is how weak Russia is. Aggressive, but weak. It hasn't been able to do anything like the things it claimed to be able to do. The military hasn't performed particularly well, to put it mildly. Are we wrong to take that lesson from this? Is it a view that you have some sympathy with? Indeed, inside NATO, is it a view that we have some sympathy well, with? Well, I think we need to be very careful. So on the one hand, I agree. Uh, we have seen their operation, our shortcomings. We have seen the morale uh, issues. We're seeing that they have severely underperforming. And that's something that, uh, that I think it's factual. Where I would be cautious is to draw the lesson that because Russia is underperforming and because they are essentially proving to have many flaws at, from the strategic to the operational level, that because of that they are less dangerous. That's when I am not sure. Because what I see is since the start of the war, I see Putin not changing his maximalist goals. I see Russia mobilizations efforts. I see them throwing mass trying to overcome their, their operational shortcoming by simply throwing masses and masses of people with zero regards for their lives. Um, 
and uh, I see that when I come, when I when I when I see all that, I, I my lesson is we would be uh, it would be a mistake to become complacent. It would be a mistake to think that just because Russia is severely underperforming that we can uh, be less vigilant. And even a weaker Russia can pose a series of problems uh, from instability in the neighborhood to uh, scenarios of them uh, utilizing uh, an array of prohibited means to wage warfare. So when I put it all together, I say, yes, we should take we should take uh, we should look at their operational failures and learn from them but no we should not be any less determined in supporting ukraine or any more or or have any complacency because they will continue to uh, wage war for as long as they can i think that's the way i see their thinking evolving i see the country becoming even more totalitarian even more closed off i see them forging stronger partnerships with countries like china i see them receiving military assistance from iran and north korea when i put it all together um, I think, unfortunately, we, we can just not afford to be to be complacent, even though, yes, they are not. They are severely this myth of Russian invincibility has been forever busted. That's a good thing. Uh, but unfortunately, I think that they are still uh, they're still a direct threat uh, to Ukraine and to your Atlantic peace and stability. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have a sense as well that NATO imposes a discipline, NATO membership imposes a discipline on a country. So some people talking about the future and talking about Ukraine and Ukraine's eventual membership and saying it's not just that that is a, a way of defending Ukraine and defending everyone else, but actually it's a way in a sense of um, uh, making sure that nations like Ukraine remain disciplined in their responses to the various pressures put on them. In other words, NATO membership comes with responsibilities Absolutely. as well. As well, I would have some sympathy for that argument in the sense that membership has been uh, has served many different purposes, right? Uh, if you go all the way back to '49, and you and if you if you take a time machine and go back then and tell the founders of NATO that they will enable European militaries to do defense planning together, to share with each other what, they, what capabilities they want to acquire, to exercise shoulder to shoulder, to build this culture of interoperability. I don't think they would have quite, uh, I mean, of course they were hoping that would happen, but it was not a given coming from the ashes of two or worse and a history of centuries where cooperation was not the name of the game for different militaries, right? So in one sense, through NATO, you have built this culture, uh, unthinkable, just seven short decades ago, of cooperation uh, militarily, but that has also laid the seed for the political and the strategic cooperation that ensued. And that after the end of the, of the Cold War, I think NATO enlargement was a key enabler of your Atlantic uh, of the of of your Atlantic uh, enlargement too and it was a pre it was almost a precondition or a or a prequel to to the end to the accession into the European Union so it was hugely politically consequential so when you put it together I think yes membership has responsibilities but it has also a very important uh, both military and political function Benedetta Berti thank you very much Thank you.